One of the things, um, and it's a good, Sintom 7 is a good Sintom to be on um, at this point. Sintom's tomorrow, we're back on that. So. Start passing some Sintoms. The story of the United States in the 20th century and into the 21st is also the story of the, 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 and the entire world. That we are going to, this block, block seven, takes us from uh, American imperialism and the Spanish American War uh, to World War I, the foreign policy of the 1920s. Uh, the Great Depression is really only our, our only domestic thing that we are looking at, particularly in this block. Then we will do the rise of the dictators, the coming of World War II, and the Second World War. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here that people are interested in, um, and hopefully I will, you know, we can make this as interesting as we can. So, we're going to start today's discussion on kind of imperialism as a concept. Uh, briefly, kind of look at the map, talk about the map for a few minutes, and then go into um, American imperialism. Talk about some pros and cons, some poetry. Um, this is something, I believe, um, we're going to watch an episode of something called Drunk History. It's funny. Um, have you seen it? It's funny. Um, this is something that I believe um, you studied last year, that imperialism is something that I am certain, Stephanie, is in the world history uh, curriculum. People have been debating why for a long time, but whatever the why is, it is a fact uh, that starting around 1500, Europe jumped ahead of the rest of the world uh, in terms of its technology, scientific advancement, uh, number of inventions, that for some reason, and people have, you know, put forward lots of different theories as to why, um, Europe, at the beginning of the Renaissance, took this great cultural leap forward and developed better technologies um, and more ways to use those technologies kind of, you know, through private business and the state than the rest of the world did it. So you got you developed this idea of exploration and colonization and why people wanted colonies, all sorts, uh, it, it relates that it becomes a cycle. That if the belief is, if we go back to our friend Mercantilism, the which is the economic theory that undergirds the beginning of this, Mercantilism says that a power, maybe Great Britain as an example, France as a third, and Holland, or France as a second, and Holland as a third, mercantilism's goal is to do what? A little review. With whom? This is the point to export more than you import, to have a favorable balance of trade. Colonies are important for that. So Great Britain has two colonies. The raw materials from those colonies get shipped to, uh, to Great Britain. Great Britain manufactures them into something, sends it to its own domestic market, and then back out to the market for the colonies. Why does France want colonies? Why does it, in this mindset, this mercantilist mindset, why does France feel the need to get its own colonies? What will happen to France if it doesn't? Why? Yeah, they said that they'll fall back in the world economy. He's right, but why? In a mercantilist system, what do you not want to do? Import. Import. You don't want to import stuff. So if Britain has the colonies and France wants that stuff, what will they have to do? From 
Britain. From Britain, which means they are importing more than they are. They are sending out gold. Remember, mercantilism, the point is to make a big old pile of gold in your capital. If France needs to buy stuff from Great Britain, that means they are sending them gold, which means their pile of gold is getting littler and Britain's pile of gold is getting bigger. So in order to forestall that from happening, what will France do? Get its own colonies. Colony, colony, who would have third colony? And what is that going to make Holland and Britain want to do? Get four colonies. Yeah, get four colonies and then five colonies. And Holland joins the fray. It becomes this constant competition. Uh, and it's also, it's, it's finite. It's a zero-sum game. There's only so much land on Earth. Colonies are finite, zero-sum. That means if I control Cuba, that means someone else does it. That's, that's a zero-sum game. And so, in competition for colonies, the countries are going to be in competition as well. And sometimes that competition leads, obviously, to war, as we saw in the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War is a competition between Great Britain and France for colonies in North America. Why do they think they need colonies? Well, the goal is to create a closed system where everything you need, you are getting from your own colonies. If you don't have enough colonies, that means you need to import stuff, which in a mercantilist mindset is bad. And so you get, by And then you get into things like national pride. You know, we have the most colonies, we're really awesome. You don't have any colonies, you suck. There's that. You need, obviously, militaries to protect these colonies. You have policies to improve the lives of the places that you have colonies. It becomes this whole setup of what the European state structure starts to look like. And it peaks in the late 19th century. By 1900, this map is 1900. By 1900, pretty much every, there's a couple, much of the world has been colonized by the European powers. There are some exceptions. The Latin American republics are not colonies. They break away from Spain in the early 1800s. Um, they are their own independent countries, but kind of under the influence of home. The United States. Monroe Doctrine keeps the European powers away. The United States is the main trading partner of most of these Latin American countries. The Latin American countries need loans. They go to the United States first. So they are nominally independent. Um, Liberia is independent. That's the country that was set up by Americans to be a haven for escaped and freed slaves. Ethiopia is an independent country uh, ruled by its ancient monarchy. China, in name, is independent. But if you study world history, all of the European countries carve up the Chinese coast uh, into spheres of influence. All this stuff is in your notes. We're not going to spend that much time looking at it. Point is, by 1890, the world has been colonized by the European powers. The largest empire in the world belongs to the British. The British um, is in this, per this pinky color. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, much of Africa, Egypt, and uh, Ireland, and most, the, uh, the, the tip of the Arabian Peninsula, the old British colonies, lots of the most islands you see around the world, British colonies, and most importantly, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire is India. Um, at the peak of the British Empire, more than about a fourth of the population of the entire world lived under Queen Victoria's reign. Um, the saying was that the sun never set, never set on the British Empire. What does that mean, that the sun never set on the British Empire? Just what does that mean? No, the actual sun never set on the British Empire. Yeah, geographic. What does it mean? 
Yeah, even when it's midnight in London, somewhere in the world where the British flag is flying, it's the middle of the day. That's what it means. It, it's not a. It's it's an actual statement of truth that somewhere around the world, it was the middle of the day, and the British flag was flying, even if it was midnight in London, in England. France had a, a large empire uh, in West Africa, in Vietnam, Madagascar, other islands scattered around. Spain retained an empire. Portugal retained an empire. Italy uh, owned Libya, Norway of all places owned Sweden, uh, Austria had an empire in Central Europe, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, Russia conquered all of Siberia, Japan conquered Korea. In 1900, there's only about 30 independent countries in the world. Do you not? Yeah. Now? About 210. The United States comes late to this game. The United States comes late to this game. So does Germany, which is going to be one of the issues. But the United States comes late to this game. The United States had spent the 19th century expanding from a strip of land on the east coast of North America across the continent to the west coast, dealing with issues of sectionalism, secession, civil war. By the time the United States starts to say, hey, we're one of the most powerful countries in the world, we ought to have us an empire just like the rest of them, most of the land, all the land, is already taken. And the United States has also had the advantage of not, we talked, so for a hundred years almost, 1815 to 1898, that's more than a life, that's a long lifetime. For 80 years, the United States followed George Washington's advice and pretty much stayed the hell out of the rest of the world. And we had an advantage in a lot of sense that we could do that. The United States, if she so chose, could definitely stay out of the rest of the world in a way that France, for example, cannot. What's the difference? Why can the United States choose to not associate really with the rest of the world in a way that France can? Geography. Geography. Why? Because oh, yeah. Because like always the United States is on the continent. Yeah, that the United States is surrounded on one side by the Atlantic Ocean, on the other side by the Pacific Ocean. To the south by a weak and corrupt state, Mexico, and to the north, British Canada. And after 1815, the United States and Great Britain kind of realized they have a lot more in common than they do apart. And, you know, but after the Civil War, this becomes, even today, the border between the United States and Canada is the longest unguarded border in the world. There's no military on the Canadian border. With the United States. What about the mountains? The the Mounties. That's the police. The Mounties are the police, the British Columbian police. There's police. But if you go, you know, if you go to the Chinese border with Russia, guess what? There's a hell of a lot of troops on both sides of that border. The Koreas, obviously. Even the you know, the border between Algeria and Libya, or Egypt and Gaza are all filled with troops. The United States and Canada, no troops. I was wondering how many really catch. So the United States has this advantage of geography. The Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. But finally, in the 1890s, the United States has already spread right across the continent. By about 1880, the United States was the world's largest economy, that we had settled the slavery question, the sectionalism question, industrialization had happened, and now kind of the United States is looking to expand and start punching at its weight. It is, it is, it is kind of the way to look at it, that 
It is the world's largest economy, and we are not involved in the rest of the world like all the other most powerful countries in the world are. So a lot of Americans started to look at the rest of the world and see a role for the United States to play there. And the story starts in Cuba. Or as John F. Kennedy would have said, Cooper. Cooper. Cuba is a Spanish colony. It's been ruled by Spain literally since Columbus stopped in there in 1494, wherever it was. Starting in the 1880s, there is a rebel excuse me, there is a rebellion in Cuba against Spanish rule. And the United States takes an interest in this rebellion. I mean, Cuba's very close to the United States, 90 miles away. <laughs> we identify with the Cuban rebellion because we see it and we see ourselves in it. The United States is a country born in a colonial rebellion against the mother country. Here's the Cubans fighting their own colonial rebellion against Spain, and we sympathize. Our sympathy is encouraged by how brutal the Spanish were in putting down this rebellion. The Spanish come in and they start, you know, killing people left and right in Cuba in an attempt to hold on to their colony. They invent, and they're one of the Spanish gifts to the 20th century was the concentration camp invented in Cuba in the 1890s. Take people out of their native villages, concentrate them in one area where they can be watched over by the Spanish government. And Americans are morally on the side of these Cuban rebels. This is where all that yellow journalism comes in. This is not a nationwide phenomenon. It is a phenomenon mostly in urban cities, on, or urban areas on the East Coast. But in a competition for newspaper readership, newspapers are playing up this human interest story. The Butcher Whaler, the, the Spanish general's name. He gets the nickname Butcher. You know? Stories about, you know, killings and rape and pillage and all the awful things that the Spanish are doing in Cuba are front page news every day. And you're a lot more likely as a casual reader to pick up a newspaper with a screaming headline on it than you are, you know, a more judicious piece of reporting. And before we spend a lot of time judging the people who bought into this yellow journalism, you all do the same thing. <coughs> How many times have you been on the internet and you've seen something that looks like this? You won't believe what such and such a person did. Click here to find out. And what do you do? Click. <laughs> many, many, many times you click. Because when you click, where do you go? Not usually. When you click, what, where do you go? You go to a web page. And what's on that web page? <laughs> the information's not important. What's on that web page? That's not important. Advertising. Advertising. That's how the internet makes money. Guys. You ever wonder how like Facebook makes a billion dollars? Like, you don't have to pay any money to Facebook. Companies pay billions of dollars to advertise on Facebook. When you click on, when you click on, uh, you can't believe what happened next. Click. You find out what happened next is never as good as what you think it might be, but also on that page where you click next is a whole bunch of advertising that your eyeballs are now looking at. Companies pay good money 
for you to put your eyeballs on their advertising. That's how the internet makes money. No, you don't. Every time you see it, it goes into your brain. Like a jingle. Yes. And the way, look, advertising, advertising is not an exact science. But even if it's something you don't think you need, if you've seen an ad for it, how many of you got how many of you guys need, you know, at the age of ten, how many of you needed cars? But how many of you could list different car companies? Most of you. That's called advertising. When you one of the things they one of the things that advertisers do is they put they try to plant seeds in your memory so that when you oh I really do need a blank you already know what that blank is because you've seen it lots of times. I'll just give you one. And, and now the, the technology and the algorithms, and how, they know everything about you. It's a little scary. Just one little, and I'm sure you know. Before Christmas, before Christmas, I wanted to get my kids like cute Christmas morning pajamas. So I went, I started Googling around for pajamas. For a freaking, I was looking really very specific. For a freaking hour and a half, I was Googling pajamas, 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 pajamas. I finally found, they didn't have exactly what they had for him what I wanted, but not for Charlotte. So I finally finished. And then literally for the next month, every time I was on, you know, face anywhere, well, all the ads were about pajamas. I was I didn't put on Facebook, I need pajamas for my kid. But the algorithms that are in the internet that track your IP address, they know what you're looking at, and that. So I, so today, do a little experiment. Search around for a half hour for one specific type of product, then log into your social media, and ads for that product are gonna be everywhere. Every time you answer, every time you answer a poll, they don't poll you because they poll you to get to. They sell your information to companies who know that you said that you like X. Well, that means that company X is going to start advertising at you. There are companies now, Mr. Ben and I were talking about this yesterday, there are companies now that send you stuff without you even buying it. They say, based on your profile of what you've bought in the past, we think you would like this stuff and they send it to your door. And they say, just send back what you don't want and we'll bill you for the rest. What? Because by the people, you're... What? You can do that? You can do that? Why not? Oh, I, I never bought it. <laughs> what, what's the crime? What, what's the, what's the law they're breaking? Because if I don't return it, then I gotta pay them, right? Yeah. But if I don't get it. But you don't get what? Like, if they don't ever give it to me, do I still get it? No, no. They send it to your house. You come home and there's a trunk of new stuff for you. You put back in the box what you don't want. They get it and then they bill you for the rest. And you're, of course, a lot more likely to keep it if you... I've already got it. I might as well just send them the bill. I don't even have to leave my... It's, it's, it's crazier than even Amazon. Four clicks and it shows up at your house. And it does, it's incredible. Four clicks and it's at your house in two days. It's crazy. So my point is, a little bit off topic here. The point is that the, the, the newspapers of the yellow press tried to get your attention and got people's attention just in the same way that advertising gets your attention you know, in 2015, that people are attracted to screaming headlines, you know, sensationalism. We all slow down on the side of the road when we see an accident, and that's that's just that's just our nature. So all of this stuff is building towards war with Spain. President McKinley does not want to go to war. There was an economic depression in 1893-45. 
The United States was just climbing out of it. The economy was just starting to kind of hum along again. And McKinley thinks that war uh, is going to ruin the economic recovery. Um, but the pressure, uh, based on what Spain is doing in Cuba, uh, based on the yellow press, based on all the, based on kind of Americans' emotional attachment to these underdog Cubans, start to push McKinley's hand. And McKinley, in uh, April of 1898, or March of 1898, sends an American battleship to Havana Harbor. So riots in Havana, American lives and property are at risk. McKinley sends the battleship USS Maine to Havana Harbor. You send a battleship anywhere, it's, a, it's showing the flag. Here comes this big, giant American battleship, beautiful, white-painted, gleaming battleship. And the message is clear. We're watching you. Watching. The, Amer the United States government has eyes on what's going on here in Havana. And after the ship was in Havana Harbor for a little while, what happened? It exploded. The main blew up. Killed about 260-some-odd people. In the United States, all hell breaks loose. Because obviously, who do we blame? Spain. Remember the main to hell with Spain. That's the cry on people's lips. Remember the main to hell with Spain. Spanish government says, ah, oh, wasn't us. And they are quite simply not believed. Now, in all likelihood, in all likelihood, the main explosion was an accident. But there was no way to tell that at the time. And the attitude in the country was such that war with Spain, um, that the American people got their blood up over this, what they saw as an unprovoked attack on an American warship to 260 some odd people by the Spanish government. Here they're, they're, all, you know, they're, they're murdering Cubans, now they're murdering Americans. Um, and the pressure on McKinley goes gets too much uh, for him to handle. Congress is going to go and declare war even without the president's, you know, asking for it. So McKinley decides to ask for war, uh, ask Congress for a declaration of war against Spain, which Congress does provide in April of 1890. Teddy Roosevelt, character that he was. Teddy Roosevelt in 1898 is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Um, which is a subordinate post if there was a Secretary of the Navy who did anything. But the Secretary of the Navy was a political appointee, kind of made a deal with Teddy Roosevelt, I'm going to go to all the parties, you can run the Navy. And Roosevelt said, yes. So Roosevelt's running the Navy. Roosevelt sends a message to the US fleet out in Asia. There's an uh, American naval squadron in Asia uh, and says, War with Spain is getting close. Position yourselves near the Philippines to destroy the Spanish fleet out there. The minute war is declare, declared, Roosevelt sends a message to his fleet. And pretty much the American fleet rolls into Havana Harbor the morning after war was declared. Guns ablazing, um, sinks the entire Spanish fleet. Um, the flagship of that American fleet's in Philadelphia. You can see her. She's right across the river from USS New Jersey. It's USS Olympia. Um, it's an old 1898 battleship. Um, the Americans destroy several dozen Spanish ships, kill thousands of Spanish sailors for the cost of one American sailor uh, who died of heat stroke in the course of this battle. There's another squadron. There's another naval battle out here around Cuba, another significant American victory. Um, Spain knows it can't win a war. Spain is this old, decrepit, <coughs> inefficient empire. It's fighting for its national honor. They know they're not going to win. The American army does not do nearly as well as the Navy. The army is a disaster. The Navy puts on a good show. The army, much less so. It is a mess from start to finish, pretty much. Um, all these volunteers are, you know, congregate down in Tampa, Florida, where it's, there's mosquitoes and malaria and everyone's sick. They're wearing Civil War era wool uniforms. They are dropping like flies in the tropical heat. The commander in chief of this expedition is somebody that is so fat that he can't even get on a horse. They're carrying him around like on this litter. 
More people die of disease than in actual battlefield combat. It's a mess. And it's only because the Spanish army was no better that the American army managed to win. Teddy Roosevelt makes his name during this time. Once he has directed the ships so they can destroy the Spanish fleet, he resigns his post as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and decides to, he wants to be close to the front lines. He resigns from the government. He gets himself a commission as a colonel. He gets all of his rich friends to join his group, his regiment. He gets a bunch of college kids to join his regiment. He invites, you know, blacks and any immigrant, anyone who wants. It's the most ethnically and class diverse unit in the American army. And Roosevelt puts himself at the head and gets himself on a boat, sails himself down to Cuba, lands and heads off to the front line uh, so he can cover him. And who else does he bring with him? He brings his own reporters, his own artists, his own journalists, who are going to report back at the amazingness of Teddy Roosevelt. The Rough Riders. Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. And Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders play a key role in the most important battle uh, in Cuba, the Battle, battle of Santiago at, um, at San Juan Hill. Teddy Roosevelt charges with his men up the hill. He breaks the Spanish line. And of course, that night, all the journalists and artists that he brought with them are scribbling in their reports. They send them over the wires uh, back to the United States. And Teddy Roosevelt becomes the biggest thing in America since Andrew Jackson. Uh, he is like a hero. Um, like the country hasn't seen, a military hero really that the country hasn't seen uh, since Jackson. Um, more than Grant, you know, more than Lee. Uh, Jack, because it was easy. Grant and Lee were associated with tens of thousands of casualties. Roosevelt makes it look simple. Um, I will show you that clip from Drunk History because it's funny. Um, and although it's funny, this does pretty much capture Teddy Roosevelt's character, and pretty much what happened down at San Juan Hill. This is actually a television show. Two and a half minutes long. It's funny. Okay. Basically, what this is, we turn the other light off too. The actors, the actors are sober. They are. There's no script. Well, there is. The script is read by intoxicated college students, and then the actors have to say what the intoxicated college students are saying. Um, it's actually quite funny. So that's little Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Why? Teddy Roosevelt and his thousand rough riders go to Cuba. The transport ship isn't big enough. 300 guys have to stay behind. Every other guy had to leave his horse behind. So these guys land in Cuba and they get ambushed. They're in a valley between two hills where the Spanish have the upper hand. They're sick ducks. Roosevelt's men start taking fire. He loses over 200 of his men in his 20 minutes. Teddy Roosevelt rides up to the second in command of the regular army and he says, we're getting our asses kicked right now. The only way we're going to survive is if we charge up this hill. And the second in command of the regular army says, the colonel isn't here to make that call. I can't let you do that. And Teddy Roosevelt says, I am a colonel. It's my call now. He rides, unafraid of bullets, to the front lines 
Here, Teddy Roosevelt is. Here, his history and his people are standing behind him. He says, I'm going to go. I'm going up this hill. And I'm going to... And I'm going to defeat these forces. Follow me. If you turn around, I will shoot you. <laughs> so Teddy Roosevelt led this charge, and all of the people followed Teddy Roosevelt up to him. They beat back the Spanish forces, and the Spanish forces retreated. But Teddy Roosevelt kept charging, and within two weeks, Spain surrendered. When he was 11 years old, Teddy Roosevelt said, If I'm going to be anything, the thing that I'm going to be is a badass. <laughs> he fulfilled that promise to his young self, and he became a fucking rock star. <laughs> Actually, fairly close to what happened. Um, <laughs> Roosevelt turns. <laughs> Roosevelt turns to Spain and Cuba. Uh, pretty much within within three years, he's president. Uh, he's first elected governor of New York. Uh, he's too progressive for kind of the old guard in New York, so they said, "Hey, why don't you go be vice president? Get out of our hair." Uh, and he was, and then McKinley got assassinated, and at the age of 42, the youngest person ever be president, Teddy Roosevelt, 1901, becomes president. We're going to see more of Teddy Roosevelt uh, later in this block. But the war ends. Um, it is, it's called in the press a splendid little war. Um, for the United States, it was. It's not a very heavy cost, and um, territorial gain. So, right off the bat, number one, Puerto Rico. That's when Puerto Rico becomes part of the United States. Guam. Guam, which is like out here, still part of the United States. Um, Cuba. Cuba does not become a colony. Cuba becomes its own independent country, um, dominated. It is its own independent country, it has a flag and a president and a government and everything, dominated by the United States. And the, Cuban, the, the, the Cuban Constitution of 1902 pretty much says that Cuba can't change its constitution without American approval, and that Cuba can't enter into alliances or go to war without American approval. Um, so the United States kind of has this veto power over Cuban sovereignty. Um, and a lot of American companies begin investing in Cuba, um, Cuba becomes, you know, a very important sugar-producing colony, or not colony, sugar-producing country for the United States, and we're going to see Cuba again on uh, its blockade. What I want to talk about for the rest of today is the other chunk of land that the United States got as a result of the Spanish-American War, which is the Philippines, all the way over on the other side of the world. The United States had not cared one whit or another about the Philippines like they had about Cuba uh, before the war. But all of a sudden, due to Spain's laws, we demanded and got the Philippines Islands. And then kind of had a, a big national debate over what to do with them. This is something new in American history. And this is something that really divided the country. It was one of those things that everybody was talking about between should we annex the Philippines, should the United States become an imperial power like all the countries in Europe, should the Philippines become a colony, or should we simply let the Filipinos have their independence like we had God given to the Cubans. And this debate You know, spread around the country for a, the entire election of 1900 revolves around this. McKinley running for re-election is on the pro-annexation side. William Jennings Bryan for the Democrats is against annexation. So what I want to do now is see if we can list the reasons both sides gave for their beliefs. What did the pro-annexation side give as evidence that their belief was correct? 
what did the anti-annexation side give as their explanation for uh, why their reasoning was connected? So let's open it up. What do we think? Pro and con. <laughs> All right. All right, so that's two things right there. A uh, supply of raw materials to U.S. industry. And what was the other one in there? Philippines are a, a market for U.S. industry. This is kind of your classic colonial explanation. The Philippines has raw materials. It will be sent to the United States. The United States will manufacture it and send those raw materials back to our domestic market and back to the Philippines where they will buy manufactured goods. What else? Pro or con, doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're anti-annexation because um, they thought they were, it was going against, like, because, like, when they were ruled by Britain, the kind of, uh, the like, going against, like, the, to be a colonial master is contrary to U.S. values. Hypocritical. The United States is a nation born in a colonial revolt against a colonial master. We celebrate that. And here we are all of a sudden, say the anti-annexation ground, here we are becoming the colonial master ourselves. It's hypocritical. It's against who we are. But fine, London and Paris and Berlin, they can all be colonial masters. The United States ought not be. It's not who we are. Declaration of Independence. Hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. Endowed by their creator with these rights. They get to choose their government. The Filipinos aren't choosing their government. We're imposing it on them. That's contrary to Jefferson's declaration. It's contrary to who we are as Americans. What else? Like, uh, as a pro? National pride. All the other powerful countries in the world do this. Why should the United States be left on the sidelines? The American flag should be flying around the country, or around the world, just as much as any other. It's good. What else? Yeah. Uh, the annex countries were like through like an industry and stuff. I'm sorry? Like it was like industrialized. Uh, so, like, to help the Filipinos? Yeah. We're going to come back to this. What else? Listen to pro. Geography, geography, geography. Or as an anti? All right, let's take that as an anti first. It's too far. And because it's far, It's expensive to maintain and also expensive to protect. Yes. Before we look at, like, we map makers do us a disservice when they show us the world like this. Because this map does not make it clear how freaking enormous the Pacific Ocean is. The Pacific Ocean is half the world. Here's a globe. Here's the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is half the world. The Pacific Ocean is half the world. We have no when we look at a map that looks like that, it honestly looks as if Asia is a hop, skip, and a jump away from California. 
And that is not the case. If you're going to have a colony in the Philippines, that's about 10,000 miles from San Francisco. And 13,000 miles from Washington, D.C. That's half the world. It's half the world away from the capital. Which means, it's first of all, a colony, you have to pay colonial administrators, you have to pay for colonial. So it's expensive to run a colony. It's also going to be expensive to protect this colony. Because how do you protect the Philippines? Well, you need a fleet. And if you have a fleet, what do these ships run on? Gas. Gas. Not gas. Coal. 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 Ships run on, you ever see, I'm sure, Titanic. Titanic. How do these gigantic ships run? There's gigantic boilers that lead to steam engines, and there's guys in the belly of the ship whose job it is to shovel coal from bunkers into the boilers. About 120 degrees, about a four hour shift. Yes, and you just get covered in coal dust. So you get pretty low? No. Well, why would you? It's, there's no skill involved, and there's a million people who would love to have a job. You get paid a lot? No. 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 No, that's what you Yeah, that's what you No. Um, but, hey guys, here's the thing. On a warship, if you're going to be traveling from, the more coal you carry, the heavier the ship gets. It means the slower the ship gets. A warship, in order to have a fleet that can travel around the world, what do you need? Fast ship. Ships or traps. Ships are powered by coal. Light ship. A better, a better resource. Mm -hmm. have that. So that, that oil's going to start to be involved in the 1910s and 20s, but in the 1890s, it's coal. You can't carry enough coal for a whole trip across the Pacific Ocean. Make more bases. So you need more. You need bases. So if, if the United States is going to have a colony in the Philippines, a ship can't go from San Francisco to the Philippines and back with one coal. You need a coaling station, which means you need colonies in between the United States and the Philippines. Ergo, Guam and Wake and Hawaii. Hawaii. Hawaii is finally annexed to the United States because we need a place for our ships to go in between San Francisco and the Philippines. So it's expensive to protect. You need more bases, which cost a lot of money. What else? That also kind of what Lorna was saying kind of goes to a pro, that if we do annex the Philippines, it provides access to Asia. And a con of that, we're involved in Asia. that all these other European powers are over in Asia. If we get involved in the mix, we're just going to get involved in all the messes that take place between all the different European countries and China and big messes like that. Now, this is a secondary argument for Americans. The economic, this is the argument of the American business community, but it's not the primary argument most Americans make. This is not the primary argument most Americans make. This is the primary argument that the anti-people make. And the prime argument that pro-annexation people make is annexation will help the Philippines. The term that is used is white man's birth. There is a belief that the Filipinos are not ready for independence. They are not technologically advanced. They are Ill largely illiterate. And Americans look at this situation. Americans are a good hearted people, historically. If the Philippines. Why not?
If the Filipinos are illiterate, what is it the job of the Americans to do? Teach them how to read. If there are diseases running rampant in the Philippines, what is it our mission to do? Cure those diseases. There is this. If they don't know how to run a free government, show them how. This belief is held by a vast number of millions of Americans. And it harkens back to the very beginning. It's the same belief of Second Great Awakening. End slavery. You know, temperance. Once that it is the job of a, of a, of a person to rid the world of sin beyond their own doors. It's the same... It's the same motive as the reform movements of the Second Great Awakening. It's just not focused domestically, it's focused internationally. It's the same motive as the First Great Awakening. It's the same motive the pilgrims had. The pilgrims come to be an example to the rest of the world, sitting on a hill. The eyes of the world are upon us. This desire to be moral it's a moralistic foreign policy. We're going to see it with Woodrow Wilson. We saw it with George W. Bush. The desire to take American culture, all the good things about it, and spread it to the rest of the world. Whether the rest of the world wants it or not. But it's a powerful force in American history. Jill, you have a question? No, it's There is definitely that. We're going to look at a poem in a second that kind of explains this cultural feeling that people have. <laughs> people genuinely believe the Filipinos were not ready for independence. It's a paternalistic attitude. We've seen that paternalism in American history before. And the term that Americans use here, you're going to find it funny, and it is funny to the modern ear. But without the, no, this was not believed with, with tongue in cheek. This was not believed with irony. When people said, we're going to go to the, to the Philippines and civilize them, that was not like a half a joke. That was what people genuinely, honest in their, the goodness of their heart, believed. And after annexation, Americans are going to go to the Philippines and build hospitals, build schools, build roads, build railroads. They're going to go and, you know, you know, give vaccines to children, then because there is a, hey, look, we're also going to invest heavily in the Philippines, and a lot of people are going to make a lot of money. And we are going to use it as a military base for access to Asia. But we are also, there is always this moralistic part of American foreign policy. And we should be able to track and trace that moralistic foreign policy from here to Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations, to George W. Bush in Iraq. It's the same moralistic foreign policy. The term that we gave to the, and this is what people would say, and it's going to sound very, you're going to laugh, because it's funny for the modern year, but people said, we have got to go help our little brown brothers. Cute. <laughs> Which is cute, maybe, if he's like four, <laughs> as an adult, less cute. But that's, that's the paternalistic sense of this. And we can call this moralistic foreign policy white man's burden from a very famous poem written by an English man. Now, this poem was not written by an American. It's written by an Englishman. It's called The White Man's Burden. And I'm showing this to you. I'm showing this to you. Come on. I'm showing this to you to get a sense of the cultural 
million of the time. But the 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 feeling, if you will. Come on. All right. This is by a um, a British poet by the name of Richard Kipling, um, who you may, I'm sure you are familiar with one of his most famous works, The Jungle Book. Um, Disney turned it into a movie. Um, Ricky Tikki Tavi, the story of the the, um, the mongoose and the uh, and the cobra. Um, that's Roger Kipling. So we're going to look through it, and I want you to see if you can use this to get an understanding of what this moralistic foreign policy was, what was behind it, all right? So, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best you breathe, go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught, sullen peoples, half devil and half child. So let's look at that stanza. First of all, what ju how are the people being colonized described? Savage, but also innocent. Savage on one hand, but innocent on the other. Just waiting to be enlightened by, you know, the person who knows. Half devil and half child. Um, who is going to be doing this? The dregs of society? Who are the colonizers? The imperialists? The best you breed. The best of us are going to go do this. Take up the white man's burden in patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride. By open speech and simple, a hundred times made plain, to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Who is this for? Who does Kipling say it's for? To seek another's profit and work another's gain. Who is this all for? What, what does the word say? Who is it for? Who's gain? Someone else. Another's. These are not selfish motives, says Kipling. To seek another's profit, work another's gain. We are here to do good for others. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace, fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. What are we going to do there? Feed and cure them. And when your goal is nearest, the end for others sought, watch sloth and heathen folly bring all your hopes to naught. Meaning that the people there, they're going to screw it up. Take up the white man's burden, no tawdry rule of kings, but toil of surf and sweeper, the tale of common things. The ports ye shall not enter, the roads ye shall not tread, though mark them with your living, and mark them with your dead. Comfortable life? No tawdry rule of kings, but toil of surf and sweeper, the tale of common things. The person who goes, is he going to live a life of luxury? No. no. He's going to be toiling and sweeping. This is my favorite stanza, but it's a little comfortable to talk about this. Take up the white man's burden and meet his old reward, the blame of those you better, the hate of those you guard. How are the people there, the natives, if you will, stop it? Going to react to this? Take up the white man's burden and reap his old reward with the blame of those ye better, the hate of those ye guard. 
wrong. What if it goes wrong? What reward is this man? What, what reward is the imperialist going to reap? What reward does the poem say the imperialist is going to get? Two words, Steph. Education. No, no. Gambling. Well, come on closer. Take up the white man's burden and reap his old reward, the blame of those he better, the hate of those he love. What two? Blame and hate. He's going to get blame and hate. That's his reward. His reward for all of this good service is going to be <coughs> blame and hate. And now that this, we're going to talk about this last one. The cry of hosts ye humor us slowly towards the light. Why brought ye us from bondage, our loved Egyptian knight? All right. This is a allusion. What is this an allusion to? What is that an allusion to? Yeah, Pharaoh, what story? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you know. I don't 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 I'm sure you all know the outlines of the story. Moses takes the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. What happens? Does anyone know? They, they think he's a god. Um, no, they never think he's a god. No, no. They crossed the river. Cross the Red Sea, no. the Egyptian army drowns. What do the Israelites demand of Moses? What do the Israelites, this is why the Bible is so much more interesting than Sunday school. Why, what do the Israelites demand of Moses once they are out of Egypt? Their goal was the promised land. What did the, what did anyone know? What did the, what did the Israelites demand of Moses? All he knows is that it took them 40 years to get there. Why? Because they, they kept and doing stuff like that. Isn't it because they had to learn how to um, follow? No, they had to die. Oh. So the first thing, go read Exodus. This is interesting. The first, once the Israelites are freed of slavery and out in the desert, they beg Moses to let them go back. Because slavery is comfortable. In Egypt, they were fed, clothed, housed. Their decisions were all made for them. It was com So instead of facing the wilderness and its uncertainty, the uncertainty of freedom, the Israelites asked Moses for him to take them back into servitude. The reason they had to wander around for 40 years it only takes like 11 days to get Yeah, it, it's a quick walk. The reason they had to wander around Sinai for 40 years, according to the Bible, is that that generation had to die before the Israelites could go to the Promised Land. That one with the mindset of a slave was not allowed to go into the Promised Land. And so that's why they want... Now, Moses was not allowed into the promised land because he, he struck the rock instead of tapping it as God requested him to do. He got angry at God and death. His punishment was he was going to die with his sight, but he was not permitted in. Um, but that's... So what this means is all of these indigenous native people are comfortable in their old ways... But it's the job of the imperialists to turn them slowly toward the light and not permit them to be to go back to slavery. Take up the white man's burden, you dare not stoop to less, nor call too loud on freedom to cloak your weariness. By all ye cry or whisper, now here let's focus on this last little half a stanza. By all ye cry or whisper, by all ye leave or do. The silent, sullen people shall weigh your gods and you. What are you always when you're out 
in the colonies? Yeah. Having what? <laughs> By all ye cry or whisper, by all ye leave or do, the silent, sullen people shall weigh your gods and you. Yeah, you're being judged. You're being judged. And it's your job to do what? To come off as, the, as good. Take up the white man's burden, have done with childish days, the lightly proper plural, the easy unbrushed praise. Come now to search your manhood through all the thankless years, cold, edged with dear bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers. So, I hope this shines a light onto the motivation of this moralistic foreign policy. Now, the last thing before we go, here we have a little bit of a dichotomy here pro anti annexation. This is important in a sense because it's just a fact of it, okay? But also, I want you to remember this, because when we look at, this is gonna kind of turn into an interventionist foreign policy, we should get ourselves involved in World War I, World War II, the Cold War, versus an idea that we ought not involve ourselves. And we are going to see this dichotomy starting here, but it is going to run through before World War I, after World War I, before World War II, after World War II. This is a track, a two-sided track that you can use to understand this entire block. A desire for intervention in the world outside the United States border, a desire not to intervene in the world outside America's borders. Any questions? We, ended up, we did annex the Philippines. It did become an American colony. Um, Filipino soldiers fought side by side with American soldiers against the Japanese in World War II. Um, and after World War II, the Philippines got their independence. What are you doing? Wait, let's get to the